that there's the single understanding exactly. that we share our being with everyone and everything must be the foundation of any truly civilized culture. It must be at the origin of a, 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 a civilized culture. If we want some measure of the indication of some measure of our establishment in our true nature, I'm not sure that looking at a brain scan is the place uh, to, to look. We should look to the extent to which we are at peace and happy for no reason. That would be a better test. Imperturbable peace yes. and causeless joy. Ooh, imperturbable peace and causeless joy. Adore that. Its ultimate purpose, I, I would suggest, is is that the, the is for the reality to shine unobscured through the illusion. So the the illusion being the appearance of multiplicity and diversity, which for most of us conceals its reality. I would suggest that the purpose, if we can speak of purpose, is for that the illusion, the appearance of multiplicity and diversity, not to conceal its reality, but to reveal its reality, to express it, to communicate it, to share it, to celebrate it. In other words, for, for the appearance to become increasingly transparent to its reality. Someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? Five, four, three, two, one. Hey everyone, welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. I am super excited and grateful to be featuring Rupert Spira on the show. Hi, Rupert. Hi, Alan. Thank you so much for joining us. I have been a big fan of what you've been communicating. And for those that don't know, I'd love to read you Rupert's bio. Rupert Spira is a leading non-dual teacher of the direct path, a synthesis of many global wisdom traditions, his eloquent use of metaphor points people with great efficacy to self-realization. He has authored several books. His YouTube channel is receiving millions of views. He's hosting retreats across the U.S. and Europe. And he's a notable studio potter with work in public and private collections. I'm going to synthesize some of Rupert's key teaching, and then we'll start after that. Over thousands of years, we've been experientially studying consciousness and metaphysics. Only recently, since the scientific revolution, has a global paradigm of materialism become dominant. Industrialization has connected billions of people to electricity and the internet, plus much more. The revelation of quantum mechanics blew our minds, and now the 21st century is knocking. How can science possibly probe the most primal question of our existence? What is consciousness? If you'll join me for a moment in a game, I'd like to ask you to close your eyes and imagine you are in bed, dozing off. You immediately begin dreaming that you're in a kitchen, pouring yourself some tea. You're adoring the high quality of this full immersion where you can literally even smell the aroma. You accidentally spill a little and suddenly you snap back to laying in your bed with your eyes open. What you just experienced, we predict, is a microcosm reflecting the macrocosm. In other words, the same way we dream a reality and take a first person perspective is precisely what we are doing with this reality. It's recursive. Reality calls on us to dream for one third of our lives. Quite an obvious hint, one indivisible infinite consciousness in a dream, fully immersed in the high quality, completely forgetting it is a dream. Why we see people running around seeking objects, relationships, substances, anything is because they want to 
per pierce the veil of separation to feel whole. The irony is you already are what you seek. Rupert, how was that? That was pretty good, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> I can't add much to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, excellent. Um, if if you know if that's if that's the case, then um, that makes me happy. I'm always happy, but that makes me especially happy because it's very important to me to take what these diverse leaders like yourself around the world are communicating and be able to try and compress the messages into the most relatable stories, which is basically what you do with your metaphors. Yeah. And yes. Um, you've said infinite consciousness is the ultimate dreamer whose activity is the universe. Yes. I really like that yeah. as well. I want to, um, I want to visualize your, your lineage, uh, quickly. So let's go, um, to your teacher is Francis Lucille, correct? And yeah. did you, did you meet him around 1995 ish or when? A little bit later, 97. 97. Okay. Yeah. And then for 13 years, you studied with him. So up until yes. about 2010 or so. Yes. Let, let me just go back a little bit further. Yes. Uh, uh, and to my late teens, where I first became interested in these matters. And uh, so I started um, attending um, a school or a society in, in London called the Study Society. And it was uh, essentially a, a, a school of classical Advaita Vedanta. So for 20 years or so, I was in this classical Advaita teaching, practicing uh, mantra meditation and exploring the, the classical non-dual teachings. And it was uh, after 20 years of that, that I then met Francis. Yes. He introduced me to the, uh, the, the direct approach and he also introduced me to the to the tantric approach, which he had uh, um, learned through his teacher Jean Klein. Yes. And as yes. you say, I then spent uh, thirteen years or so with Francis uh, before I started yes. speaking about these matters myself. Yes. Yes. Very few people have the opportunity to be introduced to non-duality at the age of sixteen, which is what you had. That's true. I was fortunate. My mother and stepfather at the time were both very interested in these matters. They originally went to uh, Collett House, the, the, the study society in London. And so they introduced me uh, to, to Collett House, the um, Advaita teaching. Um, they also practiced the Mevlevi turning. And so I was introduced, I was very fortunate at, at an early age during my mid to late teens to come across this understanding, to, to meet a lot of people and spend really most of my time with a, with a lot of people, most of them older than me at that time, who were interested in these matters. So this really, yeah. from my mid-teens up until my mid-30s, the, uh, the classical uh, uh, Advaita or non-dual ap approach was really the, the backdrop to my life and, and was really the main focus of my life during those years. And, and Francis's lineage goes to Jean Klein, who he met in 1975. And then, and then, and then Jean Klein was with uh, Pandit G. Rao uh, in yes. 1950. And Pandit G. was a professor of Sanskrit in Bangalore. And uh, he came from a lineage of Advaita teachers. Yes, Th that's true. Jean Klein was also a, a yoga teacher. So what was uh, unusual about Jean Klein, and I think immensely valuable, is, is that he, his approach incorporated the body and didn't reject the, the body and, and indeed the world, as some of the classical Advaita teachings coming out of India did. Uh, so this was the this is what I referred to earlier as the tantric approach, which is an approach of inclusion, yes. Yes. including the totality exactly. of experience, yes. rather than the <laughs> classical Advaita r r approach, where, where uh, the, the, the body and the world are considered, uh, at least in some expressions of it, are, are considered d dangerous realms where we might um, lose ourselves. Or, um, so that was something very valuable immensely valuable that Francis um, introduced me to this this inclusive path 
Yes. As opposed to the path of exclusion or the path of discrimination, which, which don't get me wrong, I have the highest uh, regard for and spent 20 years on that path myself and it was immensely valuable. But there was something incomplete about it yeah. for me because of this uh, um, lack of inclusion of, of the body and the world. And, and of course, during these early years, I was practicing, as you said uh, earlier, as a potter. I was spending my, my days making pots in my studio and my, and my nights reading Ramana Maharshi. But as a potter, I, I, I loved things. I spent my life making things. I loved things. I loved beauty. And so there was no question of me renouncing yes objects or, or so it wasn't until i met francis that this that that my love of beauty that i was exploring in my studio by day and my love of truth that i was exploring at home by night r really came together and I, I i realized that really the love of beauty and the love of truth uh, are, are yeah. indeed the same the, the yes. same <laughs> yes yes and this is this is key, and we're going to touch on this throughout our conversation, is this full embrace of the beauty of what is what we have here, and the full unleashing of 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 inner potential artistry gifts into our uh, into our reality. I, I want to um, I want to relate what you just said also to Sri Aurobindo quickly and the Mother Mira Alfasa and the Integral Yoga in the sense that they also uh, highly, highly emphasize the importance of anchoring the divine, anchoring um, the full embodiment in every day. And that way it basically butterfly effects out into everything um, that we do with our family, our friends, our work, um, our relationships, everything. And that's the, the process of the, um, the beginnings of a more uh, beautiful and uh, truthful and, and awakened to the true nature of reality uh, world. Um, yes. Yes. Now, Rupert, Ultimately, the biggest questions lie in the field of metaphysics. The What is the ultimate nature of reality? Um, why is there something rather than nothing? What is the nature of consciousness? Um, and then kind of science and spirituality basically do their best to understand that. That's ultimately what we're here doing is trying to understand that. And a good way to, you've you've said this question before, a good way to begin your atma vichara self inquiry is by asking the question what is my source where do i come from uh what is the what is the genesis of 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 all of this um what is my real nature and yeah. you had a really good conversation with sam harris as well because i think it was a, a good way to juxtapose the consciousness only with someone that is also interested in um, spirituality, but also has a grounding in uh, deep science and uh, materialism. And so he kind of said in return that there's a big temptation to make consciousness the very first principle. And that um, he, he then said that that would mean that consciousness then subsumes uh, cosmogony, the big bang and the reasons for that. Um, but then you counter with the question, what is it that knows or is aware of your experience? Yeah, well, I, I think there's, there's good reason for making consciousness the first principle, simply because it is the first principle of our experience. So <laughs> why not start there? It's just an undeniable fact of experience that consciousness that all that is or could ever be known is experience and consciousness is the fundamental and primary re prerequisite of all experience so if we want to build a model of reality why not start there it is the primary element of our experience so isn't that scientific just to 
start with something that is actually experienced, something that is real in experience, rather than starting with an abstract idea, namely the existence of something called matter outside and independent of consciousness, which nobody has ever found or could ever find or will ever find because all it is ever possible to find is the content of consciousness. That to me is abstract. What, 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 what to me is really um, realistic and scientific is to investigate experience, what, ask ourselves what is the primary element of experience, which is obviously consciousness, and it, to, to build our model of reality based on that rather than on something that is abstract. Okay, so the, the take is that the most, the ground or the most fundamental first principle is experience, and then that is consciousness, that is awareness, and then that is the nature of reality, is that, is consciousness, is awareness, and not that there is a big bang that happens 13.8 billion years ago and after the billions of years of evolution of matter, then the complexity of body activity creates a consciousness that is is there is there a point of any that, synthesis that, there or that, that model of so, sorry sorry to yeah interrupt you that, that, that model of reality is based on the evidence of thought and perception it it, it presumes that what we perceive of the outside world is, is, is real in the way that it is presented to our senses. And that thought's interpretation of sense perception is correct. And extrapolated from this model of reality, we go all the way back to the Big Bang. But th this, is, this idea is based on the presumption that perception and its interpretation through thought is correct. Okay. Okay. But it might not be. Maybe our senses don't. Yeah. Maybe the a combination of perception and conception, that is the finite mind, maybe they don't give us an accurate model of reality. Maybe reality is filtered through sense perception and appears in accordance with its limitations. In other words, the limitations that we see, that we believe pertain to reality, may simply be the limitations of the perceiving apparatus, the finite mind, through which we perceive. We cannot be sure that the limitations that belong to our yeah. perceiving apparatus yes. actually pertain to reality itself. How do we know that we are not simply seeing a, an objectification or a reification of the limitations of our own mind? Yes, yes. And after all, when the activities of thought and perception subside, as they do in deep sleep, time and space also subside. When thought and perception begins again, when thought begins again, Time seems to begin when perception begins again. Space seems to begin. And this happens every, every single time thought and perception disappear. Objective experience disappears. Every time it arises again, objective experience arises again. Is that a coincidence? Could there be a connection between yeah. the two? I would suggest that there is. And these are those hints that we were mentioning earlier, these most... Uh, simple hints. In science, there's Occam's razor. The most simplest is likely correct. And in this case, it's so, in a sense, simple. And it is so, it's so much like a hint. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. I, I, I liked your analogy, your, 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 your summary at the beginning about the dream. Uh, uh, we are given numerous hints as to the nature of reality. And if, as you say, we use Occam's razor, Occam 
said that of, of two competing theories, we should always choose the one that makes the least assumptions. So here we have two models of reality. One, that all reality appears within consciousness and is the activity of consciousness. That doesn't make an assumption. It is actually our experience. The second assumption is that what we, what we know of reality is generated by something outside consciousness, namely matter, and indeed gives rise to consciousness. In other words, it, the, the second theory suggests that that which is never experienced, namely matter, independent of consciousness, gives rise to that which is alone experienced, namely consciousness. So this, this makes uh, uh, an enormous assumption, the assumption of the existence of something outside consciousness. Well, if it was necessary to appeal to the existence of something called matter in order to explain our experience, then it would be legitimate under Occam's razor to, to, to refer to such a substance. But it is quite possible to make sense of our entire experience of reality, referring only to consciousness in the way that you suggested with the dream analogy. And it, 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 this consciousness only model also not only enables us to make sense of our experience of reality, but it enables us to make sense of many phenomena that the matter model does not, is not able to explain. So the consciousness only model has a far greater explanatory power than the matter model. If we were to visualize the Ouroboros, the, the snake's head eating its tail, if we were to envision the wholeness um, of that, then is then the, the infinite consciousness is then present at the, oh, it's present everywhere, but it's present at the Godhead and the tail in the sense that the tail portion, this model of science that currently um, is that many of us agree to and in consensus enjoy the benefits of is at the the tail point infinite consciousness is at the tail point and the big bang is the process of the tail point itself still evolving over time into what we have so there is still that process and and it's going towards the telos of a godhead of the continuation is that approximately how, how how do you resonate with that i think the the model of um of the big bang is is a, a model that is accurate or reasonably accurate within the parameters of sense perception and, and thought. It, it is an interpretation of reality within the limits of perception and, and conception and is, is as such a, a reasonable uh, interpretation and has, uh, is, is, is a useful interpretation. I'm not suggesting that um, I, I love science. I have numerous um, scientists friends i have great respect for for, for what they do it, it's a valid interpretation and can be hydrocarbons used. have literally made us what we are really uh, yeah. yes so yeah. so it, it's a it, it's a valid relative model of reality that that is useful has numerous useful applications but it is not an accurate model of reality and that th there are no accurate models of reality even the the consciousness only model that i am suggesting is, is falls short that, that, that there are no accurate models interesting um, and that's the idea of the elusiveness of the mystery and the beauty of that and to continue op openly and blissfully in complete honor of that mystery while while simultaneously being interested in the models in making and playing with models that can help us live better lives yes okay 
Okay, let's 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 go into um, identity. This is very important because in uh, in Sanskrit, the word uh, amkara is very interesting, the ego or egoism. Um, and so the idea is that do you identify with the ego? Do you identify with the, the limited, finite self in this body and nothing else? Or do you identify yourself as universal, as transcendent? And there's a huge difference between those. And also, uh, we can call something like an awakening, awakenings or enlightenment or this, this, the process, whether it be gradually or, or suddenly, to feeling universal or, and transcendent, uh, the process that uh, we all are aiming to pierce that veil. And science does, I would like to hear your take on this. Science does a very interesting job at revealing the unity and the interconnectedness. And I, and I would love to see more spiritualists embody some of these scientific understandings of unity, because I think that would help with the synthesis, but also scientists themselves, like in 1945, if they were more spiritually awake, they wouldn't have dropped bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So there's that other side as well. Scientists can also gain a decent amount of spiritual knowledge. The general idea is this, you cannot, and science has proven this, you cannot, you take 20,000 breaths of air every single day. You can't live without oxygen, but you can't take one of those 20,000 breaths without summoning the photosynthesis that is happening from phytoplankton and trees around the planet. So you are deeply interconnected with the oxygen cycle of the planet with photosynthesis. And so a question is something to ask oneself is, do I, what, where, where do I draw a line or like a, a, a boundary? When, when do I say that I am not the phytoplankton in the trees that provide me with oxygen? All of these, the approximation is 25 sextillion, which is 10 with 21 zeros after it, oxygen molecules that I am inhaling every breath, every breath. And then those are oxygenating my body. Where do I draw the line? I have, I have a thousand, we, we all each have a thousand species of bacteria in our gut microbiome. So do you affiliate yourself with the 1000 species of gut bacteria and how they have 2 million total genes versus you have 20,000 genes? So a hundred times more genetic expression happening from those from those gut microbiome another example is when do you when do you take if you take the apple or the banana and when you when do you become when does the apple or banana become you when you when you bite it and you begin chewing it when it actually becomes digested and you go through the process of cellular respiration and the adenosine triphosphate powers you and energizes you. So this is, these are the things that science literally proves interconnectedness and unity. And I'm curious, what do you think about the scientific angle and how it can help the spiritual angle of non-duality flourish? So, Alan, you, you, you've just um, demonstrated uh, from a, a physical point of view the, that, that we as individual people or, or we as a, as, a, as a body are intimately connected with the universe. In fact, not even, not, not, not even intimately connected. We, we are not even apart a, a from the universe as a independently existing entity either to be connected with it or or not connected with it that there is no clear distinction even from a physical point of view which is the point of view you've just demonstrated and, and which as you say uh, quite rightly science m makes very clear it, it is an arbitrary line but the the non-dual understanding goes much further than this it, it doesn't presume to begin with, that what we essentially are is a body, whether or not we are intimately connected to the universe. The non-dual understanding 
first and the non-dual approach makes this deep investigation into what we essentially are. M most of us, most people believe and feel that what they essentially are is, is a body uh, which has generated consciousness inside it, in, in particular inside the brain, and, and that the body as such, uh, sorry, that consciousness as such is uh, born or, or appears when the body appears, that it evolves as the body evolves and that it dies or disappear, disappears when the, when the body disappears. In other words, the, the consciousness shares the limits and the destiny of the body. This is the standard approach in, um, in our culture. And even from this approach, what you have just demonstrated, the interconnectedness of, of us, this apparent body, this body, it, it, um, it is absolutely true. The non-dual approach, as I said, goes much deeper. It, it first of all investigates what we essentially are. And it, it, it tra in this investigation, we trace back our experience of ourselves discarding everything that is not essential to us. Uh, our thoughts are obviously not essential to us. They are always appearing and disappearing. Our feelings, likewise, sensations, perceptions, activities, relationships. These are all um, elements of experience that are added to us. They remain for a while and then they leave us. But what, what is the us? What is the essential irreducible element of ourself? And if we, if we undergo this experiment, and it's a very simple experiment, anybody can do it, we end up with just our simple being, our simple self-aware being. It's like, it's like undressing yeah. at night. When we, when we go to bed at night, we, we take off all the layers of clothes. Each layer is, of course, superfluous to us. The clothes are changing all the time. And we get to our naked bodies, that, that, that element of ourself, relatively speaking, that cannot be removed. That is our naked being. Well, if we do the same thing, relative to our experience and we take off so to speak our thoughts feelings memories uh, sensations perceptions activities and relationships we end up with pure awareness and th this is a pure self-aware being so this is the first great discovery and that's it, what we share is that yeah, well I, I was just okay. going to say that the, the first step is the discovery i, I am awareness this is not yet what is referred to as enlightenment or awakening in the traditions. Then the next step is to investigate the nature of okay, the awareness. So to review, so we took off all of the layers of identity and then we got to the most primal, the yes. most first principled, which was the awareness. Yes, we took off everything that we were identified with, everything that we thought was essential to us, thoughts, feelings, etc. And we got back to our, our naked identity, our original, our, our original face, as they say in the, the, uh, the Zen tradition. Uh, the, uh, the, the essential nature of the mind, as they say in, in Buddhism, the self, as they say in the, in the Hindu tradition. Uh, so that's the first discovery. I, uh, what I essentially am is simply the fact of being aware or awareness itself. The next discovery is, is to discover the nature of the awareness that I am, the, 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 the discovery that it is ever present, that it has no limits, and that its nature is, it is inherently peaceful and unconditionally fulfilled. And that this is the recognition that is traditionally referred to as enlightenment. So I would say this was the, the second recognition. Uh, happiness is my nature. Yes. The third great Med recognition. That meditation the is not something that we do. It's what we are. We are the happiness, the bliss, the yes, infinity. The, yeah. Yes. The essential nature of the awareness that I am is peace or happiness. Yes. Okay. And then the third, we can come back. We, 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 I'm, I'm just. Yes. Yes. The, the, third, the third great recognition, which you uh, um, hinted at. The, the, the recognition that the being that we essentially are is shared by not only everyone, but everything. In other words, everyone and everything 
derive their apparently independent existence from a single, infinite and indivisible reality or, or whole whose nature is, well, ultimately it is unnameable because all names have evolved to uh, describe the content of experience. But if we are going to speak about these matters, let's give it a provisional name. In, in these circles, we tend to speak of it as consciousness or awareness. In religious circles, it is referred to as God's presence or Brahman. Or, but in common parlance, it is referred to as I, myself, my being, the, 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 the one infinite and indivisible reality, which doesn't connect us all, because in the ultimate analysis, there is no all, there, there is not a, a multiplicity and diversity of objects and selves, each with their own independent existence, to be connected. In the ultimate analysis, there are no independently existing objects or self. There is simply a single, infinite, indivisible whole, which is refracted through the prism of the finite mind and appears as many things and many people. So as a concession to the belief that there are many things and many people, we can say that we all share our reality, but in the ult if we really want to be, try to be more accurate, in the ultimate reality, that there is no we, there are no uh, separate objects or selves, either to be united or not to be united. There is simply the unity of being that appears yeah. Yeah. as this multiplicity and diversity. And, and the recognition, we are, we are speaking of this in, in intellectual terms and analyzing it with the use of our rational mind. But the recognition that we share our being is a familiar recognition that millions of people, I, I would suggest that everybody ha yeah. has some taste of, and that is the experience of love. Love is the recognition that we share our being. Yeah. 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 There's s several things there. There is the, you mentioned the, uh, the Tao that can be named is not the eternal Tao. Um, there's also a Wahat al Wujud, which is that uh, the unity of all being, the unity of all existence. Um, so this is, it's also interesting. It's such a perennial wisdom. It's literally across. Yes. All of these ancient spiritual traditions across of, the planet. Of course it is, because it's what's true, because it's what re what's real. That anyone, at any time, I irrespective of their location on the earth, the, the, the time in which they have been built, anyone that goes to the nature of reality, by definition, goes to the same reality, because reality is always the same thing, which is not a thing. So, of course, all these diverse expressions of truth or reality are going to point to the, in their own unique, unique ways, ways yeah. are going to point ultimately to the same reality because reality is always real. It is always the same. It doesn't, reality is not one thing in India and another thing in America. It's not one thing in, in um, 2000 years ago and another thing today. Reality is, and in 2000 years time, reality will be exactly what it is now. Although if, if human beings still exist, then they will express it in very, very different ways. The language we're speaking will seem so archaic to them. <laughs> and, it, and we cannot imagine what that language will be. Yeah. Yeah, and we, t in, in the way that science also aims to approach this and validate this is through this unbroken chain of evolution f to that source point. And even the way of perceiving it that way and all of these other ways in terms of trying to pierce the veil of where is this boundary and at least the slow process of getting beyond the veil of the ego to the universal, to the transcendent, to the unity of all existence is there's so many of these different ways up this mountain to that nature of reality. But like you say, at that pinnacle point at that nature of reality, the ultimate point is that infinite consciousness. And I, I think this is a very interesting way to put it is there is this ultimate point. So this kind of leads me into the next point, which is um, I would love to talk to you about this analogy of the symphony. 
And the reason why I'd like to talk to you about this analogy is because the unity of all being is the symphony. Infinite consciousness is the symphony. It is the 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 the, the seemingly or the um, illusory, which is that it does it's the way that it appears is uh, is has has it can can lead people off um, from the from the truth. So it's not as it appears that the symphony has a a good analogy in the sense that and I want to hear what you think about this. There's the unity of all being, but then there's, there is this, again, this illusory, this, the, this, the self, this Alan and Rupert and all of these 8 billion seemingly individuals, but part of the beauty of the symphony analogy is that people don't reside in the ultimate, which is okay. Non-duality. Excellent. And r r rather it's both you, the unity, it's non-duality. Excellent. And it's also, I get the opportunity to be an, we get to be artists, right? We get to, we get to make great uh, studio uh, pottery, right? We get to make great content we get to engineer we get to design we get to tinker but we do that all from the place of unity we do that all from the place of non-duality is that about right how does that resonate yes uh, ultimately everything ev absolutely everything comes from or, or is an expression or modulation of consciousness or awareness I use the words synonymously uh, some of our thoughts and feelings and our subsequent activities and relationships are mediated through the belief I am a temporary finite separate self so even though those thoughts and feelings and the activities and relationships that they generate ultimately come from consciousness. They do not express the, the, what is true of the nature of consciousness or reality. Why? Because they are filtered through the belief in separation and therefore express that belief. Ultimately, of course, they still come from the same place that everything comes from. So I would suggest that uh, true creativity uh, uh, is any uh, could could be said to be any um, form, be that form in in words, in music, in uh, yep. any art form, is is a, is a form that comes unmediated, directly from our our deepest reality or, or, or being that is not filtered through the sense of separation, although it requires the agency of the person to articulate that expression. The, the source of that expression doesn't come from a, a, a person, the, the feeling of being temporary, mm. finite, mm -hmm. separate. It is an expression of the reality that lies behind, so to speak, the, 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 the finite mind or, or the separate person. And, and Which is why the artist calls themselves a channel so often. Yes, yes. And, and, and the purpose of this art that, that is informed by um, the background of awareness is to bring the truth or the reality that is inherent in it out into the world in order to be shared with humanity. Yes. Yes. And, and that this is the idea that I may be a, a violinist, but you may be a saxophone player. And there's also a drummer and there's a cellist and there's the clarinet. And that's the idea of and they're all. And by the way, two clarinets are pl maybe playing different harmonies and so there's that as well so that's the idea that all eight billion are in that sense art artists in the symphony and that they have their you they have a unique expression yes uh, okay um, go ahead yeah can i um 
can I upgrade your metaphor? Please upgrade it, yes. <laughs> because your, your, your metaphor is, 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 it's a beautiful metaphor and, and it, it's true, I can see what, what you're trying to articulate, but the, the, the first metaphor that you referred to, the metaphor of the dream, has, um, I think is more efficient and is clearer. So can, can I, if, if you want, we can go back to the, the symphony, but can I re-articulate what you're saying in terms of the, of the dream metaphor? Because I think it's easier to speak about and much easier to understand. So as you said in your introduction, take what happens to us when we have a, a, a dream at night. We, uh, where, are you, where, where are you located now, Alan? Where, are you, where do you live? In South Dakota right now. You're yep. in Dakota. Okay, so yeah. say, say um, you fall asleep in South Dakota and you imagine that you're walking on the streets of London. You don't view the, the dreamed streets of London directly from your mind asleep in South Dakota your mind has forgotten that it is dreaming. Yeah. It has overlooked itself and your own mind has located itself within its own dream. You now seem to be Alan walking on the streets of London. That is the only way your mind can perceive the dream by overlooking itself, locating itself in the dream and yes, viewing yes. what is in fact its own activity from this localized perspective in the dream as the streets of London. Now, everybody else that you encounter on the streets of London, which from your limited perspective, seem, who seem to be separate people, are in fact the activity of your own indivisible mind. When you wake up in the morning, you realize th the entire dream, all the different people, and all the different objects were the activity. There were no entities there. It was all the activity of my own mind. It only appeared as a multiplicity and diversity of objects and selves from the illusory perspective of the self that I seemed to become in the dream. Now, Let's say that you now, you meet one of these people, you meet an old friend on the streets of London in your dream. You haven't seen this friend for a long time. You both go to a cafe, you sit down and you have a conversation about something and you both disagree. You're, you're talking about um, American politics, okay? And, and you completely disagree with your friend uh, uh, about. So you, 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 you have one point of view, your friend has another completely point of view. So your point of view, you, you each have a series of thoughts. You think that your thoughts are right. You think your friend's thoughts are in, incorrect. But, but it, so you can have two completely different thoughts, opposing thoughts that, that seem to be completely opposite to each other and are indeed in the dream opposite to each other. But when you wake up, you realize that both the true thoughts and the untrue thoughts were generated in your own mind. And that goes yeah. for the, the yes. pleasant sensations, the unpleasant sensations, the, 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 the kind thoughts, the unkind thoughts, the loving feelings, the unloving feelings, the, the behavior that is intelligent and loving, the behavior that is cruel and unjust. It all ultimately is the activity of a, a single universal mind. Yes, yes. In so in the analogy, the idea then is that infinite consciousness has within in the symphony has take we 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 are we the all the artists in all the seemingly individual artists have the the we we have a filter the filter of the the mind in the dream that then uh, is we, that there's there's a process of realizing for the 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 fi the seemingly finite minds to realize that ah aha the infinite consciousness and 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 it's both aha the infinite consciousness and it is also that it's not aha okay. And, but it's, but it's aha 
and so it's the realization and it's the creation from that place of realization yes, so the, the the clarinet player the violinist etc they create their melody harmony from that place of aha and yes, yes exactly yes. The, the, exactly uh, um the, the, let's keep both metaphors uh, uh, alive <laughs> so uh, um let's let's take there are t essentially two possibilities let's go back i'm going to translate what you've now said into the dream metaphor you, you're back on the and by the way rupert i just want to say i think this is so powerful for the synthesis of east and west because the the east is very on the non-dual and the west is very on the individual and which is yeah. very interesting because then it can synthesize them into that yeah. harmony. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 So th let's go back to the, um, the dream analogy. You meet your friend. So you, 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 you are the dreamed character. Let, let's continue to call you Alan. And your, your friend, uh, um, he's called, let's say he's called David. So Alan and David are, 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 are talking in the cafe. So, so let's say that, that Alan has recognized that the, the essential nature of his mind, the essential nature of himself is shared with everyone and everything. Although he, Alan still perceives from the yeah. localized perspective of his body, he can only see the streets of London from where he's sitting on his cafe table, but he knows that the nature of that which perceives in him is not limited to located in or generated by his body. So he knows that although he seems to be a separate individual, what he essentially is, is shared by everyone and everything. And his thoughts and feelings and his subsequent activities and relationships are informed by this understanding. Now, yes. David does not realize this. Alan's okay. friend, David, believes, it, he, he re, Alan's friend David reasons with himself, well, every time I close my eyes, the world disappears. Every time I open my eyes, the world or the streets of London, in this case, they reappear. So it's perfectly obvious that whatever it is that perceives the world must live just behind my eyes in my brain and was obviously generated by my brain. It is limited to my brain. And when my brain dies, my consciousness will die with it. In other words, David believes that he is a temporary finite self that is separate from, albeit related to, everyone and everything else. And all his thoughts and feelings, or almost all his thoughts and feelings, and his subsequent activities and relationships are informed by that understanding. Yeah. So Alan and David yeah. have very different kinds of thoughts. They, they're different in, instrument players in that sense as well. If one player is playing well, only- They're, different, they're you know. different instruments, but what's more important is that the understanding that is expressed through the instrumentality of each of their bodies yes, and minds yes. is a different understanding, although ultimately yes, yes. it is all the activity of yes. Alan asleep in South Dakota. Yes, yes. Nevertheless, in one case, the, the, in the case of Alan in the dream, the, the, his thoughts and feelings express the reality. And in David's case, they, they, they do not express that. They express separation. And as a result of the belief in separation, David is able to not only think and feel, but act and relate in the ways that are not consistent with truth, love, yeah, beauty, yeah. justice. Yes, yes. And, to, and, and to extrapolate now, from David, if you were to take David's point of view, um, in extreme cases, uh, one whose thoughts and feelings and subsequent activities and relationships are informed by this sense of separation is able to commit um, acts of gross unkindness and injustice. Yeah. They are still the activities of the same infinite yes. mind, but filtered through the sense of separation they are able to behave in a way that is not consistent with reality. So, Whereas yes. what Alan in the dream does, everything he says, he, he, he is an artist and the purpose of his art is to express his understanding and communicate it and, and, and share it. 
just, just yeah. as that is the case for this... Alan in real life as well. <laughs> okay, uh, back, back to the symphony. <laughs> it's, it's so, this is playing so beautifully. So the, <clears throat> the ultimate dreamer of infinite consciousness dreams up the dreams up the the illusory universe in the sense that it's it does it's not it doesn't seem to be exact what it what it is but yeah. can, can, I, can yeah. I hold that thought just for a minute yeah Alan. go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, i don't like to interrupt but i, I want to I, I wanted to say this the last time you yes you please about the illusory world because i think this is this is very important it, it's yes. something that i misunderstood for years and I think it's something that causes a lot of people who would otherwise be interested in these matters um, trouble and for, yes, for good yes, reason yes. with yes. this approach. In, and that is because this, the world is referred to as being an illusion. And for many people, the idea that something is an illusion is tantamount to saying that it is not real. Yes. So I want to make a very clear distinction between yes. something that is not real and something that is an illusion. An illusion. Yes. yes. So let, 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 to just, let's just, I want to use an example. A, a square circle, try to imagine now a square circle. Or in the Zen tradition, the one hand clapping. Let, let, okay, but let's, yeah. let's stick with yeah. the square. <laughs> try, try to imagine now a, a square circle. We can't do it. In other words, it's not even possible to imagine the illusory image of a square circle. A square circle is not an illusion. It is utterly non-existent. Yeah. However, when we are watching a movie, for instance, and we see a landscape in the, in the movie, the, the landscape is obviously an illusion, but it is not non-existent. There is something that is there. There is a reality to the yeah. illusory landscape. And of course, when we go up to it, we touch the landscape, we find, relatively speaking, that its reality is the screen. screen. Now, yes. All of this, the world, as you rightly say from this, in this perspective, the world is an illusion, not in the sense that it is not real. real. It is absolutely real in the sense that it is the world is an illusion in the sense that it is not what it appears to be. It appears to be a multiplicity and diversity yeah. of objects and selves only from the limited and localized perspective of a separate self or a yes. finite mind. Yes, yes. This is going to play beautifully. Into, okay. So, yeah. I'm sorry, yes, right? that, that, go, that was very go important. Back to your, go back to your thought about the illusory <laughs> world. <laughs> that, that was very important, Rupert. Thank you. So the ultimate dreamer of the infinite consciousness... Um, Ha we have this um, dreams this the this the illusory which is it's not what it appears to to be um, s symphony and then here's here's what where I'm really interested in this symphony the symphony has the the these these eight billion seemingly again illusory in the sense it. Uh, artists that are individual that are being filtered through the, the the finite mind and that but here's here's something interesting my um understanding of 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 infinite consciousness i think and i think it was um atmananda krishna menon who said that if you do have to um think of it in a sense you can think of it as behind 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 you the infinite consciousness um, and that the, the more that you go through the process of self abidance so you go through Atma Vichra, self-inquiry to gain the realization of infinite consciousness, and then you have the process of self abidance So the idea is that you have potentially varying degrees of artistry in the sense that there are people that have deep self abidance in infinite consciousness so when they're playing their violin they're doing it in as in the acronym sto service to other so they're playing their violin with service to other because they're they're they've they've realized that versus maybe a clarinet player who in the case of david in your dream remember so this is where we can connect the two analogies david in the case of the dream hasn't went through the deeper self inquiry and self abidance process. And so he is under more of the acronym of ST, 
S, service to self. So he is playing the clarinet, but that's why he's also going through the process of seeking objects, relationships, substances, all these external things to make himself happy and peaceful. Um, so how, how is that? We're, I, think, I feel like we're getting cl closer to an interesting synthesis between the yeah. dream oh. and the symphony. Is it? Okay, so and do you see the spectrum also in terms of the eight billion? And do you see them evolving as well in the sense that someone that is service to self, inevitably, Rupert, we had slavery and we don't have slavery anymore in much of in much of the world. And so there is a sort of ethical or consciousness or awareness. It, not in a sense that that consciousness or the awareness is evolving, but our ethics and our morals and our philosophies are evolving to be more towards service to other and more towards the unity, towards that truth of the infinite consciousness. Uh, yeah. How, how, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, um, an, an ethical code would be a, a, a code that laid down a, a series of um, behaviors that are expressive of truth or reality that come that, 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 that show people how to behave in line with or in a way that is consistent with the fact that everyone shares their being, that all ethics can be boiled down to that single fact. Ethical yeah. behavior is behavior that is consistent with the fact that we all share our being. This is why St. Augustine, when asked about these matters, ethics and morals, he simply said, love and do whatever you want. He, he meant simply realize that you are one with everything and everyone and as long as your behavior is consistent with that understanding you don't need any moral code that, that you, everything you do will be consistent with that understanding the reason why we need um, ten commandments or a moral code is because for those of us that do not yet feel this we are yes. we are told how to behave in a way that is consistent with this understanding until we realize it for ourselves. So let's go back to uh, David and the symphony. So the violinist is, um, you say in, in your analogy, the violinist is, is one who is, is uh, aware kind of, yeah, of, yeah. of, of that yeah. the, the, the she shares her yes. reality yes. with everyone. And the clarinetist <laughs> does not yet r realize this. He, he, he okay. still believes and feels that he is a, a temporary finite self. However, I would suggest that many artists and many musicians, when they are in their studios or when they are performing in their, in their quartets or their bands or, or, or their orchestras, that they are at least for the duration, uh, for a period of time in which they are performing they are, they, their art, they transcend their limitations as a person and they perform in a way that is expressive of truth or reality. When they then go back to their everyday lives, they revert to believing and feeling that they are a separate self or an ego. But many people, uh, um, in fact, this is why for, for, for some, for many artists, their, their, their art is a kind of, it, it's, it's, um, it, it's not a compulsion. It's something that they, they can't not do. That, that they, they know that when they are in their studios or performing um, in their orchestras or band, they are in touch with something that they know is so utterly alive and true. And in that moment, they do transcend the sense of separation. They are expressing the truth, reality, love. So it's not, it's not black and white. It's not either you've recognized yourself, mm -hmm. your, your true nature, and yes. you, everything you do expresses that, or you haven't yet. There is a spectrum. Yes. Beautiful. Yes. 
and, 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 and it's not yeah. only true. Of, uh, sorry, it's not only true of, of artists. It's it's true of everybody. Yes, e exactly. Every, in in that and, sense, all eight billion are artists. In that sense, yes, everybody, yeah, yeah, yeah. all eight billion of us know the experience of love. In other words, everybody has tasted the fact that we share our being, and everybody has had the experience of behaving and relating in a way that is consistent with that understanding. For most people, it's only that behavior is only directed towards a few people in their circle, their friends or their family. Yes. But nevertheless, they've still understood and felt what it is to, 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 to share our being, even if that is not their consistent experience. And Rupert, would you say that we are over the last several thousand years, if not tens of thousands of years, that we have been going more and more towards the the general general uh, real the the full embodied realization more and so. more of that? I hope so, Alan. I hope so. Because that's that's and that's the general idea of what it, like an evolution yes. when people say that word. That's yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I tend to be optimistic. optimistic. I, I, yeah. I, 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 everything ultimately is destined to return to its source. There is nowhere else for it to return to. So ultimately, everything yeah. is destined yes. for its source. Yeah. One could argue that there is more, more violence, more disharmony, more conflict in the world today. I would suggest that, that, that the old structures were that, that, that in in our society were egoic structures they were structures yeah. in, in our corporations in our governments in our institutions in yes. our, but they were um structures that were based upon an egoic sense of self as more sense, tyrannical a, a separate self and that expresses itself in extremes in, in in tyrannical dictatorships but also in much smaller ways in in families in companies in in communities yes. and the, 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 sen the sense of separation can express itself. So I would suggest that the, the chaos we see in, in, in our society today uh, and the, the violence, the conflict, I, I hope uh, and, and I believe that, that, yeah. that it is the evidence that these structures are falling apart because they're not based in truth or reality. Yeah. And although we're witnessing a, a time of great upheaval, I hope that it and I believe that that it makes a, it makes for the possibility that a, a, a new um, order will emerge, one that is based on yes. our shared being. That yes. this yes. must be that, that there's the single understanding exactly. that we share our being with everyone and everything must be the foundation of any truly civilized. Culture. It must be at the origin of a, a, a civilized culture. I love that. I love that. That first principle of recognition of it's shared the, being. It, yeah. It, 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 it's the principle that it should be the fundamental principle of all, well, not only of all of us, but, but, but because we're speaking of the world, of all politicians. Yes, exactly. All, all po politics should be yes. in the service of one idea or one understanding alone, namely everyone and everything. When I say everything, I include everything because I'm not just talking about animals and people. I'm talking about the earth, yes, yes our environment, yes, yes. that everyone yes. and everything <laughs> share their being. That, that, that should be the single guiding principle of, uh, of all people in general, but politicians Yes. In general, that their policies, their individual policies, then in relation to different, to different situations and events, would would be the means by which this understanding was then expressed and, and shared and, and communicated and implicated in society. Yes, we have been very obsessed about taking that recognition of shared being and having it deeply uh, embodied at. Uh, 
Davos at the World Economic Forum in the global 500 top companies, all the presidents and congresses of the world in Hollywood and Silicon Valley, all of these places, especially in people that have so much guiding influence um, are the most important, especially to have that recognition of shared being be that first yeah. principle. And, and when it becomes the first principle, Rupert, it also enables um, the, the, the recognition that my clarinet or violin or saxophone or drums or bass or whatever I'm doing, it must be for the, the, the service to other. It must be for um, augmenting the social fabric, for uh, enabling the basic needs on like a Maslow's hierarchy to be met so that if air, water, food, energy, education, healthcare, et cetera, are met, it enables people to have a deeper uh, self-abidance. It enables the inquiry into the true nature of reality, plus it enables them to become an art, a, a artist in the symphony as well. And so that's sort of the general process that at least I see yeah. happening. One who is... Um... One who feel, not only understands, but feel that they share their being with everyone and everything. They play in tune <laughs> in, the, in the symphony. And one who does not feel this plays out of tune. tune. <laughs> out of tune, trying to hoard materialistic possessions and um, that type of stuff that, uh, that versus um, playing in tune. Um, I, I, I like that. I like that as well. That's so, so excellent. Um, wow. Yeah. T time, time has flown. Um, do, do you believe in our ability to leverage science in the sense that there's all of these uh, new technological um, methodologies that exist, including fMRI, EEG, uh, EKG, um, uh, the samples of the microbiome. Do you believe in our ability to, to have a biometric correlate to a non-dual state of awareness? What, what would a, a biometric correlate, correlate look, look like? like? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it would be something like a like, uh, for example, with brain, it would be like a connectome harmonic. And so that would be like the total of all of your uh, chemo electro connectomics are in a harmonic state of resonance. Um, maybe with your heart, it would be that you have a higher heart rate variability versus a lower heart rate variability for something that's more stressed in that sense. So there are these biomarkers for cortisol or there are these biomarkers for, for, for more blissful or meditative or peaceful states of consciousness, states of awareness. So do you see science potentially helping with a, with a biometric correlate of a more awakened, uh, aware, enlightened states of being? Science may discover correlates that um, indicate the one's state of mind. But whether they will help, whether those discoveries will actually help in the recognition we're speaking of, I, I, I am I'm not so sure. It, it's... If, if, you were if so optimistic earlier, Rupert. No, no, I am very optimistic. I, I just, I just don't feel that that these um, correlates that scientists may or may not find in the brain are helpful, either as indicators or, more importantly, as means yeah. to the recognition of our true nature. If we look, if we want some measure of the indication of some measure of our establishment in our true nature. I'm not sure that looking at a brain scan is the place uh, to, to look. We should look to the extent to which we are at peace and 
happy for no reason. That would be a better test. Imperturbable peace yes. and causeless joy. Ooh, imperturbable peace and causeless joy. Adore that. Yeah. Because, yeah, and, and go ahead. Norm, th this, to recognize the nature of ourself is, is so simple, Alan. It, it's been mystified yeah. and complexified and, and obscured, not by the founders of the great religious and spiritual traditions, but by their followers who did not understand or only partially understood their teaching. All, all that is necessary to go back to them beginning of our conversation is, is this metaphorical undressing, this, this uh, um, removing. It's not even necessary to remove our thoughts, feelings, activities, and relationships. All it is, in other words, it's not necessary to change our experience or manipulate it in any way. All that is necessary is to see that element of ourself which cannot be taken away from us, to see that which is essential to us not our thoughts, not our feelings, sensations, perceptions, activities, relationships, all of these appear and disappear on the screen of awareness. But the awareness is the, the essential and irreducible nature of ourself. And th this is something that is simple. Everyone can recognize it simply by virtue of the fact that everyone is aware. And everyone can, can simply it's not, as I said, it's not necessary to reject the content of experience. All that is necessary is to relax the focus of our attention from its content. Yeah. And just, just relax back into the fact of being aware, which is the, the ever present and inherently peaceful background of all experience. That, that's all. And to begin with that, this background of awareness, it, it seems to be a, a place that we visit from time to time and then we get lost in the content of experience again but in time it ceases the, the back and forth between the background of awareness and the foreground of experience ceases and we begin to be what christian men are called we begin to be established, established. in our true nature we cease yeah. just to visit from time to time the the peace of yeah. the background we we live there. We abide there. We still face experience. We still have to deal with our, our everyday experience. But everything we think and feel and in time our subsequent activities and relationships are informed by and are an expression of this background of, of peace and unconditional yes. joy. Yes, I love that always a work in progress in the sense of always becoming more and more established. And I think that's 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 very important in um, in <clears throat> making it easier for people to feel like it's not a far off thing. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Not only is it not a far off thing, yeah. our, our being is yeah. is closer to us than our most intimate and precious feelings. It is not even close to us. It it is us. Yeah. And getting getting our entire world on that closer, 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 and hopefully we have been over time getting time, getting closer and closer to that, and then and then being your unique artistry um, from that is, uh, I think, the, the the general essence of where we uh, got in in much of this. Yes, yeah. yes, all, all of us who who are interested in these matters you and i and all your viewers and, and yours we as well. all uh, express our understanding such as it is in a way that is unique to us you know i i do it through speaking and writing i i used to do it in in my my studio but there there are so many ways so many ways uh, eight billion eight billion ways some of them um require a lot of form a lot of content they involve speaking or writing or or all your lovely drawings on yeah. the wall behind <laughs> you. other people may not express this understanding in form that they, they may just abide uh, mm. just rest yeah in being and that they they are the ones that that um communicate 
the, this understanding silently. Yes. And w I'm sure that we all know yes. th what it's like to, to, to be in the company of someone who is at ease, who is at peace, yes. who, who does not <laughs> feel that they lack anything, ir irrespective of how wealthy or impoverished they may be, H how powerful it is to be in the company of, of such a person and, and how when we go home, we, we feel somehow blessed just by being with them. We may have chatted about the weather or politics or dinner, or we may not have spoken directly about these matters as you and I have done. And they may, such people may never speak directly about these matters, but they communicate this yes. understanding silently and, and, and that their communication, their contribution to humanity is just as valuable as those of us that yes. um, express this understanding in more formalized ways, like, like you yes. and I and yes. numerous others. And, and as, as we say in, in music, what makes music music is the silence between the notes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Rupert, one more um, question. Is that, is that okay? May yes, I? Of okay. Um, <clears throat> We're talking about this, this, so, this, this trajectory of hopefully becoming more and more self-abiding in that and channeling that as artistry through us. Um, where, what, is the, what is the telos? What is the purpose um, for the ultimate dreamer, infinite consciousness, to make the dream? It, what is the purpose of it? And in terms of trajectory to heading towards some sort of a, a Godhead, what, what, what happens? Do we Ouroboros another dream? Is that, yeah. And, 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 how, what, and what's the relationship with artificial intelligence and uh, like virtual realities reg and simulation theory with that Godhead and that continued Ouroboros, please Rupert. Yes. <laughs> my, my my mother, who first introduced me to these matters in my, in my mid-teens, uh, reminds me quite often that when I was about seven years old, uh, I said to her, I think that the entire universe is God's dream and that our part in the dream is to make God's dream as nice a dream as possible. Well, that was an innocent, naive seven-year-old's way of expressing what we are speaking of now. And I have to confess that I have not evolved very much over the intervening 50 or so years. I still basically feel the same thing, although I express it in somewhat more sophisticated language. But so I still think that uh, the universe is God's dream. I don't often use that language, although I am really a, a closet. Sufi, I tend not to use that language because the word God has uh, um, is so intolerable to so many people for, for, for obvious reasons it has been abused so much. So I tend not to use that language. I, I consider this to be the activity of an infinite consciousness. As to the purpose of it, to, to answer your question, I would no longer say that I think its purpose is to be as nice as possible a dream for God to have, so that God doesn't have to have nightmares. Or Its, its ultimate purpose, I would suggest, is, is that the, the, is for the reality to shine unobscured through the illusion. So the, the illusion being the appearance of multiplicity and diversity, which for most of us conceals its reality. Yeah. I would suggest that the purpose, if we can speak of purpose, is for that the illusion, the appearance of multiplicity and diversity, not to conceal its reality, but to reveal yes. its reality, to express it, to communicate it, to share it, to celebrate it. Yes. In other words, yes. for, for, the appearance to become increasingly transparent to its reality. Yes. 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 And I believe uh, beautiful. And I believe uh, Fr Francis uh, Lucille says uh, it's a eternal 
Fourth uh, of July fireworks. Yes, yeah, he said that much. I think yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I like, I like that as, uh, as, as the purpose um, for for the reality to shine through the um, illusion. Um, yeah, I, I like, I like that. And and it does seem like it's there's like a there's a titration in a sense if we can use that. Uh, more and more towards that re- towards that remembrance and um and it it and that's rupert there's a lot about l- artificial intelligence and virtual realities and simulations that i think have a lot to do with the godhead that, that's and- for another conversation <laughs> now. Let, 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 let's not get started on that now <laughs> ah, okay all right all right rupert wow this has been such a pleasure um thank you thank you for joining us well th- thank you alan for inviting me it's been a pleasure speaking with you uh, i have managed during our conversation not to get distracted by the fascinating drawings on the wall behind you fortunately they're just out of focus so i can't read them but they look they, they look marvelous and it's a pleasure to to um to meet you in this way and to have um, had this conversation and i hope um paths will will cross again either virtually if not in person in person yeah Thank likewise you. likewise rupert um hopefully um all of all of this is the oh, your contributions are present in all of this all of these brilliant um artists that i'm kind of sponging up and then i'm yeah. and then i'm 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 wringing out the sponge into this art to share yeah. with well so, yeah. i think t- talking about different characters alan playing different <laughs> instruments expressing the same understanding <laughs> your background and my background I- I- in this conversation they express our two different characters very nicely <laughs> yeah. b- b- both both singing the same song but in in very different ways yeah. And, and um, Rupert, if you guys, uh, all of the links are in the bio to Rupert's uh, work. Uh, check out Rupert's YouTube channel. It's just exploding. He has a bunch of really great videos on it, um, unpacking um, the essence of non-duality. So please do check that out. Also, um, rupertspira.com, um, the links in the bio below, has all of his uh, United States and Europe uh, retreats that he well, hosts yes this, although sorry to interrupt Andy, yes, yes they're all on on hold on moment it's all on for the moment at the moment, yeah. At the moment. Uh, yeah yeah one day i hope it's coming we'll live again yes <laughs> it's coming and i hope um i know you do retreats um in the northern california region where we host our studio uh show and yeah. um so hopefully to um meet in person then and um so. and also our our show um uh, given the studio's interest in Los Angeles as well, it, it's very interesting to potentially have you um, host you down there for a retreat in that area and help catalyze more people to attend. So, because um, that's another market. We were talking about Silicon Valley and Hollywood. Um, California is the fifth largest economy in in the world, and so to have uh, as a state by itself. So to have you also um, bring your skills, your um, your stories, your share to Los Angeles, to Hollywood, would also be very important. Rupert, wow, so grateful, so grateful. Thank you. It was you. a pleasure, Alan. Th- th- thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Take care, keep well, and, uh, and, and until we meet again. Yes, until we meet again. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. We would love to hear from you. Get chatting in the comments about all the different things that Rupert was sharing about what we were going back and forth on. We would love to hear your thoughts. Again, check out all the links in the bio below to Rupert's work. Do check all that out. Go follow him across platforms. Share his work if it resonates. Attend his retreats. Uh, And... Also, support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the spiritual leaders, support the people in your communities around the world that are making impact that you believe in, support them, help them flourish, and also unleash your own gifts as well, and build that more beautiful future our hearts know is possible. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in. We will see you soon. Bye, everyone. Peace. Namaste. Bye, Alan. Bye-bye. Bye, Rupert.
I think, I think you actually provided me with a very interesting synthesis of the dream with the symphony, in a sense. Um, it was nice. I like the way that we went back and forth uh, between the two, and uh, because e e each one has a certain, each one is, is good for illustrating a slightly different aspect of the understanding, and I thought it was nice. It was like weaving a blanket out of <laughs> threads. It, uh, it worked very nicely. Um, it was weaving a blanket out of threads. That's what it was, yeah. Yeah, I love it. And now we get to lay in it. And uh, yeah, and- And, and, and now, we get, now we get to lay in it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh,